lecture on GP consultation. Um, my name is Lawrence Tan and I have with me Miriam who's one of the other senior lecturers. Hello. And also Ali who's a GP academic registrar. Hello. So the idea of this lecture that it's a flipped classroom workshop and so if you're listening to this hopefully you will have listened to this before the actual workshop and so during conference week or campus-based learning as it's now called you'll have a chance to explore some of the issues that we're going to talk about. So the learning, learning outcomes is that at the end of this presentation you'll be able to talk about three different models of a GP consultation and then when you start your GP placement um, if you're a rural student um, in the next few months, or if you're an urban student um, next year, then you can recognise when you see your GPs doing these consultations, you might be able to recognise some of these consultation models. And if you have the opportunity, you can then practise some of those. And the other thing we're going to talk about right at the very end is a bit about information technology in general practice and how that works in the consultation. So there's almost 30,000 GPs in Australia. And if you add up all the consultations, that means there's more than 100 million GP consultations. And so for general practice, a consultation is a very, very important tool. And um, a famous GP called Roger Neighbour said that the consultation for general practice is like a scalpel for a surgeon. They both require a lot of skill, a lot of practice, and they can both do a lot of damage. So firstly, I'm going to go through um, what a normal consultation is like and you probably learned this from when you started hospital work in year, year one and so the first thing that you do obviously is develop a rapport or trust with the patient um, introducing yourself getting to know the, um, the patient's name saying hello um, and then you move into a diagnostic phase and so that involves taking a good history an examination and maybe some office-based tests like urinalysis or ECG once you've arrived at hopefully a diagnosis or a list of di possible diagnoses, you move on to the phase of management, which includes explaining things to the patient, arranging for further investigation if necessary, medications, or you might want to do a procedure, or you might refer them to someone else and arrange follow-up. However, most consultations don't actually run like this. Miriam, how many of your consultations would run like this, do you think, in a day? Uh, uh, look, maybe every third or fourth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so probably three out of five, that's straightforward. Mm. So I'm going to describe three recent patient consultations. The first one is a gentleman called Pedro, and he came to me with a headache, and he said, I've still got that headache, I think I need a CT scan. Second patient, Roxana, as soon as I called her in, she said, I'm very angry with you, Dr. Tan. And the last patient, Emma, she just came in and said, oh, I just need a prescription for my pill. How would I deal with each of those different consultations? Well, I'm going to talk about firstly the patient-centered consultation. And this has been probably drummed into you since year one, that everything that we do is based around the patient. But I'm wondering if you guys have seen doctor-centered consultations when you were in year three, or maybe Ali, you might have seen some doctor-centered consultations in your previous work. Um, can you describe anything that was very doctor-centered that you can think of? Um, well, I think with a lot of consultations, everyone has their own agenda. So the patient has their agenda, as you just demonstrated in your previous slide, and then the doctor has the agenda, which is almost what you demonstrated in the slide before, which is trying to formulate a diagnosis and a management plan. I can't think of any specific examples. Okay. Well, um, let me give you some examples here. So these are some of the complaints that I've heard from patients because you know how they always come to see you and then they complain about their previous doctor. And so these are some of the things they've said. She was in too much of a hurry. He didn't explain anything. She didn't listen to me. I didn't understand what he said. And so these are just examples of um, maybe the consultation where the patient perceived that the doctor was actually running the consultation and not actually interacting or explaining or addressing the patient's concerns. So this happens quite a lot, um, happens both in hospital as well as, as well as in general practice. Now, Ali, I think you might have seen the next slide already, but it's demonstrating the two agendas that you've talked about. And so, as you can see on the right-hand side, um, the doctor's interested in the disease process. So what is the disease? What's the diagnosis? And he makes sense of it by taking history, examination, investigations, um, and then arrives at the diagnosis there. 
Whereas the patient comes in with symptoms and the patient's feeling ill and so they don't actually know that they have a disease necessarily and so they come in um, not necessarily thinking about history physical examination but they're thinking about their own ideas about what might be going wrong, their own concerns about what might happen next and they may have expectations of what they would like the doctor to do and so they make sense through understanding what is happening and so the skill of having a good patient-centered consultation is being able to reconcile these two agendas and integrate both patient and doctor's desires and um, achieve a shared decision-making process, a shared management plan, um, and in a way handing over some of that responsibility to the patient as well. And this takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice. Um, so um, a little bit of research showing people have um, tried to measure this using different scales as to how well the doctor understands the patient's perspective, how well he understands or she their psychosocial context, um, whether they can reach a shared understanding or not, and how well they share the power in the consultation. Um, and patients in general enjoy that. However, some patients prefer um, a doctor-run a doctor -run kind of um, management approach. But in general, in Western societies, patients prefer to be um, regarded as autonomous individuals. And most GPs also prefer that because it's a lot more satisfying having the patient on side with you. Um, and as you've probably been told also elsewhere, that when there's excellent communication, there's a much lower risk of medical legal issues. Um, unfortunately, um, patient centeredness only occurs in around about three quarters of consultations, and patient centeredness tends to decline as you go through medical school training. And so I'm not exactly sure why that is, but you might want to think about that yourselves. Um, so this is an example from a research study in the BMJ um, about 15 years ago. So yeah, a little bit hard to see, but it's describing what the patient's thinking and hasn't actually voiced to the doctor and what the doctor is doing. So I'm just going to describe the second one, which is doctor number nine, patient 28. And it appears the patient presents with a blocked nose. And what's in the patient's mind is that he's broken his nose in a fight and he thinks he might need some surgery. What's in the doctor's mind is that he's got a cold and he wants some antibiotics. And so the patient um, gets given a prescription for antibiotics and the whole issue about um, the trauma and the surgery is not addressed at all. The patient ends up not taking the antibiotics because that's not actually what he wanted and he's concerned about side effects. So you can see that um, a poorly handled consultation has lots of potential problems. So there's a really cool GP technique called ICE and that's going below the surface of the consultation and seeing what's underneath there and it's exploring with the patient their own ideas, um, what they're concerned about and what they expect. And sometimes if it's not clear and the con consultation seems to be going nowhere, I actually ask the patients, well, what do you think is going on? Or um, is there anything particularly you're concerned about? Um, what kind of things do you expect that I can, be able, that I can help you with? And that sometimes clarifies the whole thing. Good morning. I am Dr. Melina Stalls, the GP registrar. How may I help you? I have a rather embarrassing problem. That is okay. I will encourage your contribution with my consultation skills. Tell me now. I have an itchy bottom. I empathize with you. That must be very uncomfortable. Yes, it is. What are your ideas, concerns and expectations? I'm sorry. What do you mean? What do you think is causing the itching? Do you think it is a cancer? No. Good. I would have needed to do much empathy or made use of silence. Do you think you have sat on something you are allergic to? Like a peanut? I don't have a nut allergy. Are you concerned a family of badgers may have moved in? I do not have badgers. Do you expect me to remove them today? No. Good. I am a GP and have no specialist colorectal training. I would have had a go, as I am a generalist and keen to try anything once. Instead I will give you some soothing cream. Why do I need cream? 
the badgers will be able to slide in and out easier when they are foraging at night. You will not find it so itchy. But I do not have badgers. I am glad we have been able to share this evidence-based management plan together and involve you in the decisions. I will now check your understanding without being condescending. What will you tell your wife about the badgers? I do not have a wife. Oh. I recognize your cue that I have not explored the psychosocial context of your Richie Bottom. Did she leave you because of the badgers? But I don't have badgers. I just have an itchy bottom. You are an awful doctor. I am going now to complain to the GMC. Do you have their number? I can give it to you if it will meet your expectations. Before you go I need to give you a safety net to make it easier to cope with the uncertainty. If you find that you have squirrels making your bottom itchy instead, then you should come back, and the practice nurse will tempt them out with nuts. You are a hopeless doctor. You have not even examined me. It would not be a good use of time as a resource to examine you today as it is time for my coffee break. If your bottom is still itchy in the hibernation period, I will examine you then. You don't know anything. I think the badgers were just a lucky guess. Is that really what you think? So how did it happen? I slipped in the shower. That's what they all say. Goodbye. Goodbye. We'll move on now to another consultation model called the Stott and Davis model. And Stott and Davis were both um, British GPs from Wales and they talked about the exceptional potential within each primary consultation. So when you were in year three doing um, medicine in context, you would have sat in on 10 um, GP days. Now apart from dealing with the presenting problem, what other things do GPs deal with during the consultation? Um, so often patients come with psychosocial problems that they would hope the GP can maybe help them with. Yeah, so the psychosocial problems, um, anything else that you tend to deal with Miriam when they come in with one thing but you might think more broadly and address other issues? Um, so then you mean the patient or me? Uh, as a GP. Uh, so I might be thinking they've come in say with a sore throat but I might be thinking we haven't finished working up that breast lump or we need to look at their diabetes management. Mm. Um, um, I might also be aware that their child's been unwell and I want to check in how that's going. So so, so the child might, not, might not even be there but yeah. you're asking about a previous yeah. consultation perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that's kind of what Sod and Davis were talking about. They were thinking we don't just deal with necessarily with the presenting problem. There's a whole lot of other issues that we could potentially explore in general practice. And so they, they described four different areas. Um, and so the yellow one is the reason that the patient comes, um, what they're actually concerned about that day. But we can also talk about how they can improve their own understanding of what to do when they're sick. And they call that modification of health seeking behavior. We might call that um, improving health literacy, or we might say, um, discussing um, patient education. Um, in other words, if someone, for example, has presents with diarrhea, part of that consultation might be showing them what they could do themselves at home next time before coming to the doctor. Um, so Miriam, you mentioned dealing with something else which might be an ongoing problem. And so, as you probably know, people tend to have more than one condition at the same time. So they might present with a sore throat, but you also deal with the diabetes or the breast lump or the um, hypertension or the psychosocial issues. And the fourth category is opportunistic health promotion. And that's in there because people sometimes come in because they want some preventive health done. They might come in because they want to have a breast check, but other times they might have been putting off that breast check for many, many years. And so the fact that they're here and you have a couple of spare minutes, you can say, when was the last time you had a breast check? And maybe we should talk about that today. Um, and even if they don't want to have that today, you can then remind them to make an appointment for next time. 
So that's um, the four different areas that you could address. And I must say you don't do them with every single consultation. That gets a bit, um, uh, sometimes patients don't want that. They just want a quick deal with this problem and go and I'll come back another time. But other times you're just um, very, very busy. But if there is opportunity to do that, that's a very useful consultation. Um, so last year, general practice was criticised by the government at the time, um, trying to encourage us to spend more than six minutes per patient. And there was the idea that GPs do sausage machine medicine. But in fact, um, research shows that the average consultation time for general practice is around about 15 minutes. You might spend five minutes dealing with their presenting problem, and then we might spend another 10 minutes dealing with other issues that, um, that might arise during that consultation. Um, so these are some resources that you can access from the College of GP webpage. The first one was um, called the White Book, so it's dealing with domestic violence and things like that. The next one is dealing with preventive health, so it's a manual for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and what preventive health activities um, could be recommended for them. The Red Book is a more general preventive health manual and I would thoroughly recommend that you have a look at that and you can download it for free. And this other one talks about health promotion and if you haven't already heard of the SNAP principles, SNAP stands for Smoking, Nutrition, Alcohol and Physical Activity. And for every single consultation you could address some of those issues. And the last model I'm going to talk about quickly is called the Inner Consultation by Roger Neighbour. And Roger Neighbour was, well still is, a GP and he works in Hertfordshire in England. And he was a well-known GP trainer and a past president of the College of GP. So he uses a hand model, and um, you can't see me stretching out my hand, but you can just imagine um, index finger is connecting with the patient, next one is summarizing, handing over, safety netting, and then the thumb kind of points back at yourself, and so the thumb talks about housekeeping or looking after yourself before the next consultation. So as you already know, developing rapport with the patient is extremely important, and most Western Sydney students are very, very good at doing that. Um, and then as you start talking to the patient and examining the patient, you develop an idea of what the problem is. The next step is handing over, um, not handing over completely, but sharing the care, sharing the management plan, sharing the decision making process. Um, step four, I'm not going to talk about because Miriam is going to talk about safety netting. And the last one, housekeeping, is kind of vacuuming up the um, psychological remains of that consultation before you move on to the next consultation, especially if it's a little bit stressful and you might be kind of not concentrating on the next patient that comes along. Um, have you, has that ever happened to you, Ali? That you've had to vacuum up yeah. figuratively what's happened previously before the next one? Yeah, definitely. Sometimes, um, I guess, like you said, if it's been a particularly difficult consultation, for example, if the patient's been angry at something that's happened, um, that can be quite draining. So yeah, taking a breath or going and having a drink of you know, a cup of tea or something before the next consult can be really good just to kind of reset and get your head um, you know, back to where it should be for your next patient so you're not distracted. Um, some tools for when you go into general practice and you can see what your GPs are doing, maybe think, okay, he's using Roger Neighbour's model there, or this is not very patient-centred, I might do it this way, and hopefully you can practice yourselves. I'm going to briefly talk about um, the electronic consultation. And this is not um, really talking about teleconferencing or um, Facebook or email consultations, but I want to talk a little bit about how information technology is used within the GP consultation. Um, and so these are some figures that you can look at at your leisure, but they describe how many medical errors occur because of inadequate information, including um, adverse drug reactions, unplanned hospital admissions, and um, just the whole burden of collecting information. Um, the government is um, promoting something called the My Health Record, which previously was known as the Patient Controlled Electronic Health Record. And it's been up to now an opt-in system, but starting from this year, it's going to become an opt-out system, which means that um, in certain areas of Australia, everyone is automatically enrolled into this health record unless you choose not to. Um, 
The reason is because um, most hospitals, GPs and specialists use different software packages and we can't actually communicate with one another very easily. But this health record is available on some sort of cloud somewhere and if you have the right access you can download the patient's health summary and information about the last admission for example and the medications. And for general practice in particular um, almost all GPs now use health records and prescribe electronically and so that's very very helpful for us. However there are still some concerns about data security and um, data integrity so whether that information is up to date and accurate um, we're still wondering how that's going to be um, after. So what are the good things about using information technology in healthcare? So I imagine that Miriam and Ali you both use computers in your consultations. What kind of things do computers help you with when you're doing a consultation? It's easier to navigate, you know, like because you want to quickly look at specialist letters relevant to a particular condition and you just click and find them, whereas you used to have to trawl through big files and sometimes patients had multiple files mm. and specialist letters may not be all in one area or could fall out. Mm. Also, um, in the, occasionally in the paper file year I had a co-workers whose writing was really totally illegible um, to me and so I really didn't know what had happened in the previous consultation if they'd seen that person. Mm. Um, but if I asked that person, they could tell me exactly what had gone on. But that's pretty time consuming. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a lot better in many ways. Yeah. Um, I think prescribing is a lot faster. Mm. Oh, with repeat prescriptions, it's just a double click and print yeah. rather than writing out the whole thing. So yeah. it definitely streamlines your consultation that way. And as Miriam said, it's a lot easier to navigate, you know, if you're looking at someone's blood results or mm. letters, mm. it does. It helps um, mm. speed things up and I think improves that continuity of care within, in, within general practice. Yeah. So, um, so I guess, you know, if you guys have grown up with um, computers at hand, you probably take these things all for granted. But it's true that prescribing is a lot easier and we often get alerts when we're prescribing to say this drug interacts with that one or this patient has renal impairment, so to think twice about prescribing this particular drug, for example. Um, and the information management, as Miriam described, looking for referral letters or producing referral letters, which I think Ali might talk about, um, these are um, made a lot easier. Um, looking for tests and finding results and then actioning the results. So if someone has an abnormal test result, I can click on their um, non-urgent appointment, for example, and the receptionist get a message to contact that patient and get them in within the next three days. Um, so that's a great way of handling that medical legally as well. And for the business part of general practice, um, it's helpful to be able to remind people when they need to come back and to recall them. And it's also helpful to work out how your billings are going and how your claims for Medicare. The good things about information technology. These are some screenshots from Dr. Lim's um, computer screen. Dr. Lim was the GP that gave this lecture previously. And so you can see there how he's um, organized his data about the patient. And he's got some reminders, redo PAP by July 2012. And there's some computer generated reminders, um, check for thyroid disease, um, he or she might need a health assessment, kind of thing. These are some progress notes and you've probably seen your GPs doing this in your GP placements and they're much easier to read. You don't have to try and decipher someone's scroll unless they're a really bad speller, in which case sometimes it might be hard to read. And this is a list of the medications the patient has. And if you try and prescribe something, um, knowing that this patient has diabetes, um, the computer can then generate an alert to say um, a beta blocker can affect the patient's awareness of hypoglycemia. You can also use the computer for, um, or the software for doing an audit and seeing what kinds of patients or um, conditions you've been dealing with. Um, and also obviously look for patient education material and your own decision support tools. So this is Dr. Lim's audit. So you can see that, that he has a lot of people with hypertension and asthma and also hyperlipidemia. And then he's got other people with depression, anxiety, type 2 diabetes and so forth. And he's carefully entered in the BMI for quite a number of his patients and you can look at the rates of obesity. And Dr. Lim was actually in the newspapers not long ago 
um, talking about the epidemic of obesity in Western Sydney. Well, what's not so good about the computer? Well, they can actually start to control the consultation and they can start affecting the doctor-patient relationship because the doctor might be relating more to the screen than relating to the patient. Um, the computer can also affect your clinical thought processes, especially if there are alerts popping up um, or messages from the receptionist and so you get distracted and not really focus in on the... Um, patients will actually move the chair to the position they want to sit in. <laughs> so often, um, yeah, they'll, if, the, if it's the clinician controlled position, they'll sometimes move it either closer to you so they can see the screen, or if it's too close to you, they'll sometimes move it move away. Back. So I think often the patient um, will change yeah, where yeah. they want the chair to be. Sometimes the patients come in and they take your chair too. So that's, um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, all right, so potential problems. Have you come across any potential problems with information technology? Well, I guess as you mentioned, confidentiality yeah. um, can be a concern if you do have um, screens open and patients seeing things. Um, yeah, so I think that's definitely something to be aware of. Mm. Um, I think as you said as well, it can be distracting sometimes mm. if you're trying to type and yeah. do a consultation at the same time. Yeah. Mm. So I think that's definitely a skill that I've had to develop is trying to give my attention to the patient and mm. do, do my notes as well. Yeah. Mm. All right, well, there's um, a lot of things. So for example, over-reliance on technology. So I've recently... Um, prescribed an antibiotic to someone, um, trusting that the computer would alert me if there was an interaction, and it didn't, and so the patient had an adverse event because of that. So I relied too much on the technology. On Tuesday in our practice, um, there wasn't actually a power blackout, but um, the practice software went all funny, and so the registrars were handwriting all the consultations, and so you just need to have a backup plan for that. Um, there's issues about the um, accuracy of the data that you put in and confidentiality, as you mentioned. There's been a study actually that shows that when people are checking the, their screens, they actually go deaf temporarily. And I thought that it was just my daughters ignoring me. <laughs> but um, now I've learned to um, get their attention first and make them look up and then speak to them and make sure they're not plugged in. Um, because, you know, it's not a deliberate deafness, it's just that they're focused on something else and it's the same part of your brain that processes visual and auditory information, yeah. apparently according to the study down there by, on the, in the Journal of Neuroscience. And so, um, you know, something that when a patient's trying to tell you something and you're typing at the same time, as you mentioned earlier, you might be temporarily deaf as well. Technology driving the consultation, so some people get into a habit of looking at all of the um, the, they just click on different suggested things that the computer's generated and that kind of takes away from the, the flow of the conversation and becomes a mechanical mm -hmm. way of doing a consultation. Sometimes the computer won't let you start until you've answered a question that's not that relevant. Mm -hmm. Like, is the patient still breastfeeding and you can't even open up the file and you've never met them? Yeah. And they may have stopped breastfeeding a year ago but it's not what they came in about and they look distressed. That kind of thing can be a bit frustrating, yeah. but you can fix it up at the end, I guess. That's right, yeah, yeah but it's, there, you know, the technology was driving. It does impede, the, impede. Yeah. 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 Um, information overload, so you guys know all about that. Um, sometimes it's just too much detail in the, um, in the software. Pop-up fatigue, so I don't know if you've been mm. guilty of closing pop-up mm. windows, Absolutely. and <laughs> sometimes they might be um, something that was actually relevant. Click frenzy, I'm referring to, um, sometimes you just click and you haven't actually checked what you've clicked for. And it might not be a problem if you're buying something on eBay and you actually get five instead of one of that product. But if it's a drug you're prescribing and you prescribe five times the dose, then that could be an issue. Some golden rules. Keep eye contact at least for the first couple of minutes before you look at your screen. Tell the patient or share information with the patient um, what's on the screen. And if they start talking to you, then just be aware that you're temporarily deaf, so turn to them and pay attention and then go back and start typing. So um, we'll just look briefly at a number of consultation models and where the computer or technology fits into there. And so go out and practice, observe, reflect on how you yourselves can improve in the future.
So um, I can't take any questions from you, but if you want to email me, I'd be very happy to answer any questions or comments you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you.